as Abaddon makes his move. The Arcs of Omen are unleashed across the galaxy. The Indomitus fleets are scrambled to intercept. The races and empires of the galaxy hunt the Arcs as much as they attempt to prevent their goals from being fulfilled. Unfettered war is rife across every sector of the galaxy. And yet, in all of this, the most dangerous threat to the Imperium and humanity itself lurk almost unnoticed, almost ignored. For in all the grim darkness of the far future, can there be anyone more dangerous than the leadership of the Legion of Zinch, the Magi Disciples of Magnus, his thousand sons? But now, a very brief word from the sponsors of this video. One minute, 34 seconds. Let's do this. Welcome to the sponsors of this video. Bloodlines, Heroes of Lythas. The game with the most novel and interesting features I've ever seen. Download and try out the game for free using the link or the techno thingy and receive this awesome starter pack. Bloodline Heroes of Lythas is a fantasy RPG with a fun twist. It's graphically sumptuous, fast and fun. You can play on any phone and build your kingdom, but more. You can breed your own heroes, oh yes. Every fortnight, new characters are added to the game, from the bloodlines of elves, orcs, lycans, demigods, dragonborn, vampires and more. Each have family abilities, which can be combined through matrimony and the fruits thereof. In 2023, you can dominate two swathes of land and claim rewards and engage in guild wars, and you can create bloodcraft legends. Raise heirs and companions, which you can alter and switch out as you wish. New legendary hybrids are released into the game, making combinations almost limitless. So download the game now, either by the link in the description or the QR code thingy, and gain one summoning crystal, 100,000 gold, and 100 diamonds. And for the next seven days, the first 20 players who leave their in-game account ID and name in the comments section below will receive a free legendary female orc champion, Ugral, one of the best warriors to carry you in the game. So why are you hanging about? Your bloodline is waiting. Welcome, gentle listener, I am Baldemort, your faithful servant, and I wish to introduce you to the forces, factions, and faces of the Warhammer 40k universe, the grim darkness of the far future, where there is no time for peace. There is only time for war. Alas, I am yet to complete my entry on the Arcs of Omen Part 2, Angron, because it is so very dense, so horribly enchanting. Hence it will be arriving next week, all things being equal, of course. In the meantime, I wish to throw back the curtain on what I consider one of the most troubling sources of threat to the Imperium and all of humanity. The Thousand Suns. As usual, I shall be interspersing quotes and explanation. I could paraphrase these entries for brevity, as so many do, but I find that the prose of the pieces needs no alteration and sometimes the abridged versions dished out are simply not as impactful as the source material. Hence, I had planned to quote on many a topic, but do not construe this as laziness on my part, for there is nothing incredibly interesting or skilled in performing a summary. And trust me, do you honestly believe with my command of the language that I couldn't do that? <laughs> and trust me, I read out my own words with far more alacrity and passion than theirs. It is a stylistic decision, nothing more. I retain my efforts for the breakdown and the stories I write in my entries. For me, in these videos, the journey is as important as the destination. Yet, as I am indeed a faithful servant, you can vote on this approach in the comments section. I will elucidate at the end of the video, but do have your say. This is a seminal moment. The time when I ask you, 
What do you want to hear? And how? With that extended throat clearing performed, let us begin. And so, as usual, for the very basics, let us lean, possibly for the last time, on existing wisdom. To quote the ruling cabals of the Thousand Sons. It is a strange contradiction that the chosen traitor legion of the Chaos Guard organizes itself within a rigidly hierarchical system. Imposed by Magnus in the wake of the rubric, this structure has been maintained by all of his gene sons, at least in appearance, through the bloody millennia since. Magnus the Red occupies the pinnacle of power on Sotiarius, both literally and figuratively. From his ensorcelled chambers atop the Tower of the Cyclops, the demon Primarch's single eye sees all, and his insidious will reaches out like Zeech's own to influence the plots and deeds of his cunning scions. Below Magnus are his most powerful lieutenants, known as the Rahati, the Magister's Templi who rule over the Legion's nine great cults. Always there are nine in this elite cabal, chosen sorcerer lords and demon princes whose empiric might and unnatural gifts surely indicate Zinch's favor. Of course, the changer of the ways is ever fickle. When one of these warlords falls from grace, their fate is often a cautionary tale against unbridled ambition and treachery. While none but the hopelessly insane would think to scheme against Magnus himself, the jealous and rightly paranoid Rahati have no wish to share power with their fellows. Thus, their ranks change often. All scheme constantly to reinforce their own positions while undermining those of their rivals, staging grand conquests, performing devastating rituals and concocting labyrinthine plots to further their own agendas. Should one of these eldritch beings take to the battlefield, it will always be in aid of such schemes, and the hapless foes soon become nothing more than victims sacrificed to the Rehati's ambitions. Bearing some of the most powerful arcane treasures in the galaxy, wielding empiric powers that make them the masters of mutation, illusion, and unbridled change, each Magister Templi is the equal of entire armies. Below the Rahati, the main power structure of the Thousand Sons comprises cabals of sorcerers, infernal masters, and further, less highly favored demon princes. Just as the Legion itself is divided into nine great cults, so a coven of nine such champions leads each of these cults and directs its efforts in real space. This is not, of course, the totality of every sorcerer and infernal champion that leads the Thousand Sons to war. None save perhaps Magnus himself could give an accurate account of how many there are, for the Legion has mustered its full strength only rarely in the last 10,000 years. Even then, with illusion and trickery being as natural to the Thousand Sun sorcerers as is breathing, none could be sure that all of Magnus's gene sons answered his call to war. Just as the Rahati schemed constantly against one another, so the rest of the Thousand Sons champions strive constantly to advance their own power and positions. Those sorcerers charged with leading the Rubrique into battle aspire to muster the arcane law and infernal influence to rise to the ranks of exalted and command entire thrall bands. Those exalted sorcerers and infernal masters already leading such war bands to war plot constantly seeking a path by which they might seize a position within their chosen cult's ruling cabal. Meanwhile, those who rule eye the mantles of their hearty jealously, and lay their plans to assume the position of Magister Templi in their own right. The rubric of Araman left a scar upon the collective consciousness of the Thousand Sons, such that overt violence between champions is rare, Magnus will not suffer his scions to fritter their lives away over petty jealousies, and punishes severely those he finds guilty of doing so. Besides this, there are too few thousand sons still truly living as it is. 
Few amongst their ranks are willing to risk the future of their fraternity in such a crude fashion. On the other hand, the changer of the ways rewards cunning, manipulation, and trickery. His demons whisper into the minds of those thousand sons, still sentient enough to hear them. They impart dark secrets, offer perilous pacts, and promise might beyond compare for those willing to outmaneuver and subtly sacrifice their rivals. Between these internecine machinations and the myriad dangers of the battlefield, many Thousand Suns champions secure the protection of the Sekhmet. Formerly Magnus's own bodyguards, these elite Thousand Suns warriors fought in stylized Terminator armor and wielded ceremonial power blades based upon the ancient Prosperine Kopesh. They ritually etched passages of their legion's esoteric lore into the plates of their armor, seeing it as their duty to guard this precious knowledge. After the rubric, their essences were trapped forever with the arcane inscriptions they had wrought, absorbing their power and becoming all the more potent for it. Now these Sekhmet guardians can be claimed by any Thousand Sun sorcerer, Infernal Master or Demon Prince with sufficient law to command them. They are utterly loyal once bound to service, and will fight with indefatigable ferocity to protect their ward against any and all peril. Below the rank of the champions, the Thousand Sons and their allies proliferate in anarchic profusion. Bands of Rubike, herds of Zangor, and Servar Chaos cults fill the ranks alongside allied or enthralled renegade Chaos Space Marine warbands. Magi of the Dark Mechanicum provide technological arcana or offer tribute of weapons and ammunition for their surf worlds. Demonic entities are bound into service, mortal psychers are taken in as acolytes or offered up as sacrifice. There are few tools the Thousand Sons will not use to work their will, and few bargains that they will not strike or later renege on in service of their goals. The Great Cults The Nine Great Cults of the Thousand Sons are immensely powerful, if much fragmented, bodies. Each offers worship to, and works the will of, a different aspect of the Changer of the Ways. In doing so, they further the overall cause of their legion, sometimes in competition with the other great cults, but always at the expense of their luckless foes. Each of the great cults specializes in a different facet of Zinchian power, such as stolen knowledge, cunning scheming, or the manipulation of time itself. These foci color the way in which the cults make war, the kinds of strategies and tactics they employ, and even informs the grand plans they seek to put into motion across the galactic stage. In order to affect these plans, each cult maintains its own cabals of Zinchian marked champions to direct its efforts. Its own ranks of Sekhmet and Rubrique, squadrons of war engines, packs of demon engines, and hosts of lesser Zinchian worshippers, whose numbers vary greatly even from one conflict to the next. Moreover, each great cult is further divided into numerous thrall bands. And as the cults differ, so too do their thrall bands. While all are raiding forces at their core, their strength, composition, and favored methods of war vary depending upon the whims and influence of the sorcerers who lead them. Some fight entirely alone, their leaders bent upon some nefarious design or self-motivated quest in which great numbers would prove more of a hindrance than a help. Forces of this sort often cross the galaxy by secret paths, opening coruscating warp portals or stealing through isolated spars of the Eldari webway, the better to strike swiftly and silently. At other times, Multiple thrall bands from the same, or even different, great cult gather their might to launch a great offensive or to defend some site precious to the Legion's designs. It takes a great event indeed to draw the great cults together and see them fight as one. Yet when they do, the very stars tremble. The most recent example was Magnus's vengeful attack upon the Space Wolves' home world of Fenris, by that apocalyptic conflict's end, Fenris itself was scarred and tainted. The Space Wolves badly mauled, 
while the nearby world of Midgardia was sacrificed wholesale in order to power an almighty ritual. By Magnus's will, did these energies draw Sortearis out of the warp's depths, allowing it to manifest in real space around the same star as long-lamented Prospero. This conflict marked the greatest victory for the Thousand Suns Legion in millennia, yet it was but the first stage in Magnus's labyrinthine plan for revenge and vindication. The Nine Great Cults The Cult of Change This cult is anathema to order. They are the great unravelers, launching their armies wherever civilization and reason exist. Similarly, in places of utter anarchy, the cult appear to impose unnatural stasis. The Cult of Duplicity The sorcerers of this cult are deceivers all. At once fractured and unified in purpose, it is impossible to know whether sects within the cult are acting in concert with or against one another's terrifying plans. The Cult of Prophecy This cult is guided by incessant whispers that bleed from the warp. From these they divine the outcomes of multiple futures and seek out events that can be twisted to their own purposes. The Cult of Manipulation Deceptive in the extreme, this cult uses its tendrilar web of influence to sway the actions of its enemies. Vast networks of mortals and demonic spies allow the cult to oversee the plots as they unfold through assassination, possession, and the sublimation of enemies' wills. The Cult of Time This cult view past, present, and future as a flowing resource to be shaped into a weapon. Their efforts send ripples both forwards and backwards in time with sanity-blasting implications for their enemies present. The Cult of Magic This cult employ pure, unfettered sorcery. They value the acquisition of all manner of sorcerous arcana, the better to lend even greater might to their rituals. The Cult of Mutation this cult embraced the warping of reality itself. By their hand, foes are reduced to mounds of mutating flesh and worlds transmogrified into demonic hellscapes. The Cult of Scheming This insidious cult create convoluted plans as a form of worship. Every victory and apparent defeat is another cunningly placed step upon a road only they can see. The Cult of Knowledge This cult believes all law, no matter how esoteric or malign, to be theirs for the seizing. Their vast wisdom allows them to predict their foes' every weakness. Zathis Vor, Exalted Sorcerer of the Cult of Time Leading a thrall band of chromatic sorcerers and temporarily enhanced foot soldiers, Zathis IV commands the very stream of time itself. Such abilities rend Vor and his warband tremendously powerful, for they wield a weapon their enemies cannot resist or fully comprehend. Yet this practice comes with terrible risks, which even now threaten to destroy Vor utterly. Through demonic pacts and centuries of arcane research, Zathis Vor has gained partial control of the causal streams of time itself. He has learned to perceive the racing river of time that carries all living beings along upon its invisible currents, sweeping them unknowingly towards their destinies. Crucially, Vor has further mastered the ability of loosening time's grip upon him and upon his most devoted followers. Even still, so fundamental a power is almost beyond Vor's control. His abilities are akin to grabbing hold of the slick and slippery rocks that jut from Time's river, hauling himself from its rushing currents and then leaping precariously from one outcropping to the next, until inevitably he is dragged back into the waters. With all this said, Vor's painstakingly honed temporal magics are powerful indeed. His thrall band, the Blade Sinister, are able to vanish from the timeline of real space seemingly at will, only to reappear guns blazing at times they could not possibly do so. 
they have preemptively ambushed those who originally ambushed them and launched coordinated attacks with their former or latter selves as allies. They have even tricked their foes into choosing contradictory paths at precisely the same fixed moment in time, and in doing so have shattered them across infinite streams of continuity through the power of weaponized possibility. Slipping in and out of the established time stream has eroded Sassis IV's own place in it. His links to the time-space continuum is becoming tenuous. Vor's followers believe this to be a blessing from Zinch, and perhaps, in a twisted sense, it is. The exalted sorcerer is surrounded by blurring simulcra of himself, each acting slightly before or after him, each choosing subtly different paths. This has made it incredibly difficult to strike Vor in battle, his frustrated foes finding their bros passing through the places he should have been, rather than where he is. However, should the effect become too pronounced, Vor will lose his place in the time stream altogether. To counteract this, he has fashioned a staff that acts as a temporal anchor in the now and focuses his ability still further. Yet if a foe were to learn of this weakness and sunder his staff, Vor might at last lose his place in space and time altogether. Astrothas the Inconsistent, Exalted Sorcerer of the Cult of Mutation The power of unbridled change burns through this master magi, squirming and growing within him until it threatens to annihilate him entirely. Astothas is said to have the Eye of Zinch fixed firmly upon him, yet if this is so, it remains to be seen whether the God of Change will reward the sorcerer's efforts with an eternity of demonhood or insanity and spawndom. No physical part of Astothas, the inconsistent, remains the same for more than a handful of moments. His entire body is in constant gruesome flux. Flesh becomes tentacular masses, becomes iridescent feathers or rippling scales, becomes glassy blue crystal that flows like water before shuddering back into post-human flesh again. His eyes are myriad custers, then compound orbs, then deep sunk pits. Sometimes there are many, sometimes singular, like those of his sire. His voice is an overlapping cacophony of hisses, snarls, croaks, and somber incantations. Even his thoughts mutate at a relentless pace, causing Astothas to alter his plans seemingly at random in response to suddenly sprouting whims or uncoiling surges of unnatural inspiration. Astothas's weapons have been tainted by his touch, transforming into unstable biomechanical abominations. His sorcerer's stave, is a horror of pulsating flesh, bulging eyes, and slobbering mouths. When used to focus its master's ruinous change powers, the staff shoots out squirming masses of sticky pseudopods and short-lived, more-tipped tentacles that engulf their victims in a rising tide of flesh. Their touch transmutes a dread curse of mutation that sees living beings and inert engines of war alike rapidly transmogrify into heaving, shrieking chaos spawn. These Astorath adds to his ever-growing menagerie of horrors. The sorcerer's unholy powers have drawn many Zangors to his banner, and it is these mutant beasts that herd his spawn packs into battle with gilded goads. The only thing static about Astorthas is his finely crafted battle armor. Perversely, Considering the flesh horror it contains, it has been fashioned to resemble an inert walking sarcophagus. The only clue to the boiling madness within are tendrils of many coloured flesh that squirm occasionally through its joints. The truth hidden within Astrothas's squirming hearts is that he knows he stands upon the brink of a final, all-consuming change, either becoming a demon prince or a damned mutilath vortex beast. By trapping his mutating body within a solid shell of adamantine, he hopes to retain physical and spiritual cohesion long enough to ascend to glory. 
instead of devolving into sprawling, never-ending madness. Phasmos Erek, Sorcerer of the Cult of Knowledge Just as Zinch is a god of perpetual change, a manipulator of the labyrinthine paths of fate, so many of those who worship him step from one destiny to another according to their own cunning schemes. Phasmos Erek is one such, a dilettante of magical studies and twisted experiments who has trod a winding road from one cult to the next. Phasmos Erek has sacrificed, abandoned or betrayed followers beyond reckoning. He has cast countless underlings to the fiery winds of war, each time his ever-shifting schemes have required a blood price. Erek is a singularly selfish creature, whose one true allegiance is to Zinch, to whom he offers worship through the unfettered accumulation of forbidden law. In the name of this cause, Erek has progressed through the ranks of more than half the great cults of the Thousand Sons. Some amongst their number have scorned him for faithless inconsistency, or the inability to focus upon and perfect a single discipline. During the siege of Corfal, Amat the Scarlet mocked Erek, claiming he would never master Zinch's deeper mysteries. Yet it was Erek, with his broad sorcerous knowledge and boundless cunning, not Amat, with his high mastery of mutative magics alone, who triumphed during the sorcerous duel that followed. Erek has so far given temporary allegiance to the cults of magic, time, scheming, mutation, and now knowledge. With each shift in loyalties, the sorcerer has accumulated new treasures and powerful artifacts, as well as fresh tracts of unholy lore he keeps in an ever-growing and extremely perilous library of grimoires. His thrall band has grown also. Sorcerers, cultists, and infernal entities drawn in by his charisma and added to the ever-changing ranks who work his vicious will. Sava, the Prince of Liars, Sorcerer of the Cult of Duplicity Not even Savu's closest allies within the Cult of Duplicity know his true name, nor indeed have any real notion of his agenda. It has been told a different title, each a different plan, and in truth all are but pawns in a scheme more deeply buried still. The Prince of Liars stands at the heart of a veritable whirlwind of schemes and plots, each overlapping one another and each founded upon a web of interlaced mistruths. He has made dark pacts with infernal beings to further enhance the post-human mental architecture in order to keep track of his manifold duplicities. Indeed, there are some amongst his cult who whisper that Java is no longer truly a being of flesh and blood but rather the embodiment of falsehood itself, whose very name shifts each time it is committed to parchment. The many overlapping masks of Tizava's helm speak out of turn with one another, rendering his intonations a writhing nest of voices whose words differ in subtle but crucial details. His hooded cloak writhes with a life of its own. It casts unnatural shadows and sometimes becomes insubstantial, as though its very existence is a falsehood. This inconsistent nature is a motif carried in every aspect of the sorcerer's war gear. Cassava's staff is a plain and understated thing, yet its core is shot through with empiric-aligned noctilis that can absorb and discharge ferocious tides of warp energy. The ostentatious blade that Tassara wears at his belt is eye-catching but nowhere near as perilous as a nine-cursed wrought dagger he keeps concealed in invisible sheaths about his person. The wealth of data slates and small tomes he carries writhe with Tashava's crabbed writings, all presented in different ciphers, nearly all riddled with falsehoods, trap spells, and misdirection. The only constant surrounding Tashava is his thrall band, whose ranks are filled with rubrique and scarab occult terminators, the Prince of Liars trusts only these souls to defend him, for the ghosts of the legions are incapable of duplicity or agenda, and the sorcerers who command them are bound to Tassava by pacts of mutual falsehood so potent 
that to break them would damn those unfortunates utterly. The Coven of Three Sorcerers of the Cult of Scheming At first glance, the eerie triad of sorcerers known as Tiyang, Tiyor, and Tiyil appear identical. The deeper one looks, however, the more their subtle differences show, and the illusions disperse, or perhaps accumulate, until the observer must question their sanity, forever believing these strange beings anything alike. Nine centuries have passed since these three sorcerers completed the final step of the forbidden rite of Vordrek's conjuration. On that night of blood and horror, they ritually sacrificed every last offender of St. Bosolius's shrine. In so doing, they bound their souls and minds inextricably in the warp, and thus magnified their gestalt psychic might by a threefold magnitude. The unspoken communion shared by these sorcerers allows them to whisper and scheme together, even should they be battling light years apart. They never speak aloud, even to their servants, and instead implant suggestions and commands into the minds of those around them through sorcerous means. Nor do the Coven of Three employ any form of written communication. Thus, their complex and cunning plans are impossible for their enemies to divine ahead of time by anything short of a psychic probe. Few psychers would be foolish enough to attempt this against the entwined minds of three such powerful sorcerers. Those who do end their days in raving insanity, as their flesh convulses and their minds run from their ears like molten and bloodied wax. When implanting their schemes, Tiang, Tiyor, and Tiyir often divide up and spread confusion by claiming one another's names, or else switch their name of address constantly to keep friend and foe alike guessing. At any time, one of these sorcerers employs illusion, one telepathy, and one prognostication. Between them, this suite of unnatural abilities serves to sow confusion and despair amongst the foe. Though they share an incredible bond of connection, Still, these three sorcerers plot constantly against one another. Should one ever succeed in slaying his two fellows, he would gain the concentrated power of all three, and thus become exalted in his own right. Such a victory is unlikely, of course, when to Yang, to Yuar, and to Yil know one another's every thought. Lord Cataclystus, Exalted Sorcerer of the Cult of Magic Cataclystes was among the sorcerers who wreaked havoc on Fenris, homeworld of the Space Wars, during the right to return Sortiarius to real space. There he earned his ascension to exalted status through wreaking unrestrained destruction and spreading unbridled change. Cataclystes is known and feared across a dozen worlds. He has many names. The Flame Immortal, the Storm of Change, the Incandescent One. The atrocities that he and his flock of Heldrakes, the Weirvok Brood, have wreaked across the Asperoth sector are the stuff of dark legend. An exalted sorcerer of phenomenal power, Cataclystus cares little for subtlety or guile. Rather, he is a living evocation of the Zinchian Firestorm, an unstoppable and unnatural disaster that eradicates or gruesomely mutates everything that stands in his way. It was Cataclystus who threw down the doors of the Bastion Imperialis on Jalzor, melting them to a molten tide that engulfed the defending Ultramarines and bored them alive in their armor. It was he who masterminded the attack upon the Gassima Convent, who immolated the crew of the warlord titan aggressor Omnis from the inside out, and called down the Imperian firestorm that consumed the Tau Cadres attacking Morgengard. Cataclystus wields a staff forever wreathed in the kaleidoscopic fires of change. He bears the accursed tome of the pyre, and an unnatural conflagration dances forever within and about his armoured form. The exalted sorcerer conjures those flames at will to lash out and engulf his enemies, but he has another use for them also. Cataclystus channels his unholy fires into the furnace hearts of his pack of demon engines, 
which he delights in fashioning and unleashing upon his foes. Enraged by the Immaterian Inferno blazing through their mechanical hearts, these terrifying war engines rampage through the foe with predatory ferocity that none can stand against. So now we know the leadership of the Thousand Sons, and being a wizard player in most games, I could admit now to being utterly bemused at the way in which the Thousand Sons are viewed and subsequently treated, not just in the fandom, but also in the very lore itself. For we have heard about their powers, their abilities, through their paragons, their leadership, now, an Astartes is far more than a posthuman slab of meat and metal armed to the teeth. Far more than that. Yet what warrior of the Imperium, even Astartes, could survive on a battlefield against such horrors, such demigods of might and magic? The ability to stop, slow, hasten, or even negate time itself, to mutate any that they view, to make reality bend to snapping point and confuse all set against them. The ability to see the future, to change it, plot and plan and ambush those who are setting up an ambush of their own, possibly the worst military situation to be in. And this is without the more simple yet utterly devastating use of more gauche or blatant powers, calling lightning down from on high, shooting bolts of energy that pass straight through armour and immolate the very souls of their adversaries. The ability to pick up a vehicle and throw it like a child's toy with the men and women it was meant to protect. The ability to walk the stars at a whim through the webway, appearing anywhere or even any when they wish. To me, it is inconceivable that they have been permitted to stay in real space on their unholy planet of the sorcerers. Unfathomable that even the Grey Knights have decided it is too much trouble far too formidable a Bastille to be assaulted again, as we saw in the Psychic Awakening. For Magnus and his thousand sons are sitting there, sending out waves of psychic power as a beacon, a beacon that is drawing many a psyker to his claws, his clutches. The Psychic Awakening, foretold even in the original book Rogue Trader, has been a watershed. Now, Millions of humans are becoming psychers, as if overnight, and many, many of them are being drawn to the world of the sorcerers by Magnus's siren's call. Magnus has returned to real space, and leads them all in mighty spells and rites the purpose of which can only be guessed at. And now, it transpires that Adaman, Arzik Adaman, has actually made it into the Black Library itself, and back out again. What secrets did that scoundrel steal from the Black Library itself, the concentrated and collected knowledge of the entire Eldari race concerning chaos? Millions of years of knowledge. What secrets does that scoundrel hold in his twisted mind? Magnus of all Primarchs must be aware of the Arcs of Omen, their existence, their courses, their progress, and perhaps even their goal. So can Vashtor somehow outwit the great schema? Zinch. For all that Magnus knows is more than abundantly aware to the great god Zinch. Can Vashtor gain a place amongst the four greater gods of chaos, while one of them is aware of his aims, his actions? But surely, as Abaddon is watched so closely by all of the gods, surely they all know not only of Vashtor's plot, but the very agreement with the Warmaster. Why do they tolerate it? Nay, by lending their forces, like Angron the Red Angel. Surely, they all know what is being hatched. So why are they all allowing this? For another god to rise means just one more army and force with which they must all contend. Or do all of the great guards of Chaos doubt Vashtor's ability to raise himself up, and none wish to be seen as thwarting him? forcing Vashtor to punish them by withholding his arms of war to their cause. But more strange still is the seeming inactivity of Zinch in all of these grand plays. Of all the gods, it is he who has the most to lose if the Archiphane is elevated, but by his sheer being, his aspect, his godhead, it is Zinch, 
who also has the most to gain from a deepening of the plotting, scheming, and maneuvering if the four gods become five. And Magnus's army is an actual one, not only his legion, for that it is, and a unified one, as Magnus executed all possible rivals, the previous leaders of the cults. Well, all but Araman, of course, the prodigal son who has been welcomed back into his heart and hearth. Thus they march to the one drum, the heartbeat of Magnus's plans on the behalf of his master, Zinch. And they gain in strength every moment of every day. Some forget the change since the psychic awakening, where everything changed. For now, an avalanche of psychers follows his beacon. They come from all over the galaxy, some fully cognizant of Magnus's nature, many woefully blind to what truly awaits them. But when they arrive on the world of the sorcerers, they are then shriven, trained, and augmented. They are submerged into the fastest and most able tuition program for any would-be wizard, any wanton witch or warlock, to be trained by the thousand suns themselves, Zinch's own legion. So what, pray tell, will the Imperium do when Magnus unleashes his fury, his untold throngs of the empowered? when he is assailed by an army of psychers, all equipped with power from not only Magnus and his wizards, but also Zinch himself. Can anything stop them? And lastly, why is Rabute Gilliman sitting on his thumbs when he knows exactly where Magnus is, what he is doing, and what is at stake? For there can be no doubt, it is the very soul of humanity that Magnus is attempting to pervert and dominate. So why is the Lord Commander doing nothing? Or is he actually under the subtle thrall of the Lord of Change? Or perhaps, just perhaps, Rubute just underestimates his brother Magnus and his legion, confident that the wolves bested them before, so a normal army of Marines could do it again, right? If this is so, then he is a fool, for everything has changed. Everything. Either way, the result is the same. Magnus builds his sorceress army uninterrupted and unchallenged. And it will be a shock beyond anything the Imperium has ever seen when the Crimson King eventually decides to go to war. I mentioned at the beginning of the video about a vote. I wish your guidance. It's time for you to decide. So hit the comments section and give your guidance. If you wish me to continue quoting from existing work, not entire tracts or books, but segments which are important, then please just put in a Y or a YES, and then other comments after a gap, or even on a separate comment. If you wish me to stop this practice and to write up the tracts in my own style, then just put an N or a NO, and then any other comment you might wish as elucidated. I wish to provide the best light entertainment my meagre skills can muster. Hence, I ask you, the gentle listener, the person I do this all for, what is it that you wish me to do? Now I do quote sections because I find them pure, because then after that you can make your own decisions and ignore my own ramblings, because you have the facts, unvarnished, untarnished, and certainly without any of my own perspectives inside. But that is sometimes rizzed by others, for no reason I can really discern. So, hit the comments section and let me know. And yes, votes on many ongoing narratives will be returning. It's about time, no? So start getting ready to take control of the rudder of this glorious ship we have created. The community, we have grown to some 200,000 souls. Wow, not something I expected when I began this journey. 
I have been Baldemort, your faithful servant. Don't forget to give Bloodlines Heroes of Lythas a crack. It is very fun. Now subscribe and like and all that stuff if you enjoyed the video. And join me every Friday as I take dives into the Warhammer universe. Or check out our other channels on natural history and mythology. Links in the video description. Patron merch notification button, you know the boogaloo. Until then, no matter what you do today, do try to make some time for fun. And I really, really mean that, guys. Do not burn yourself out. It's bloody awful. Toodaloo.